We are working feverishly to get back to normal. And I mean Bethel normal, not like everybody else normal. Because we don't want to be like everybody else. But we're working on that. We um, are talking about um, going ahead, going back to our regular schedule, starting this Sunday, where we'll have uh, Sunday school, Sunday morning service, afternoon service, Wednesday night at 7, and talking about that, I um, was talking to Pastor Reg Kelly the other day. He had invited me down uh, originally for this Sunday and um, wanted to know if that you know, was still happening, and he said that his church had kind of done what we're doing, you know, kind of bringing people slowly back in, and he said they were about 60% last Sunday, and uh, so I told him, I said, under the circumstances, I think, you know, now that uh, we're kind of hopefully crawling out of all of this COVID stuff, and I don't, here's what I don't understand. You've got people out there who act like they don't want this thing to go away. It's like they're getting too much power over people. I saw a meme the other day that said, this is, uh, hope you've enjoyed your 30 day trial of the new world order. Yeah, no, I haven't enjoyed that. So that tells me I don't want anything to do with it. Um, so uh, we're kind of trying to get back to normal. And I told him, I think, you know, that for right now, my place is here uh, with these people. And in, until things sort of get back to normal. So he said, my people were excited about having you come down. Uh, we still want you. And I said, appreciate that. So we'll make it another date. And then we'll also plan on doing um, our Sword and Shield Conference, Midwest Bible Conference. Uh, we'll choose a later date for that. Uh, as far as I know, we're still doing homecoming in August. Woo! -hoo! So looking forward to that, and I don't really want to cancel that. I don't. Um, who knows what will happen between now and then, but if we can have homecoming, we're having homecoming. Amen? So um, anyway, just be praying about that, and you know, let's pray that God gets all of our churches back together. Lisa showed me a video the other night. The church down in Baton Rouge that was, was featured on Dr. Phil because, um, you know, they were asking at the very onset of all of this, when it was, I think, at its most dangerous point, they were asking churches to not have a bunch of people in your church service. And this pastor willingly defied that. He gave his excuse on Dr. Phil that a lot of his people were not even aware that there was a virus out there. I don't believe that. I think he lied about that. To accuse a preacher of lying, that's a big thing. But he said it. He said a lot of my people didn't even know there, there was a virus out there. I don't believe that. This is the age of social networking and people in Kenya who have nothing carry a cell phone. They know what's going on in the world. And um, so then anyway, I sort of had the idea, two ideas actually, of why he was insisting on having his church service. One of them was the money. Uh, it's a church of about a thousand people. And when you see the inside of that church, you can tell there's money there. He claimed that a majority of his people were impoverished people who didn't have any money. And from the looks of that church, I ain't buying it. Ain't buying it. Then she showed me a clip of their service. People running around, bouncing. It looked like a pinball, bouncing off the walls, running around, hooping and hollering. The pastor even was he dancing, jumping around on the stage, making a big scene. And I said this the other day. You have to have, if that's your church, 
you obviously have to have a service in order to get that going with people. Because people wouldn't do it by themselves or you couldn't do that and give them that ecstatic experience through the internet. So with that particular church, they have to have everybody in the service all dancing around and hyping up everything and hooting and hollering and screaming and speaking in tongues and building. It was just like a, it was like a drunken Super Bowl party. That's what it was. And our experience here at Bethel doesn't come from that. It comes from the Word of God, which you can have no matter if there's one people in here, five people in here, a hundred people, a thousand people, or you sit at home, you're getting the same thing that we here are getting, even if we had a full house here. In other words, our religion does not demand that we must come to church and have feel this experience of a pep rally atmosphere. Because that's what they're selling to people, is a religious pep rally. And that might feel good while you're having the service. That doesn't take away the problems that you have in life. It glosses them over. And it gives you a temporary... It's like being down in the dump, so you watch some comedy program. You watch Three Stooges or whatever makes you laugh. And you laugh at that for a while, but then your problems are still there. They didn't go away. Or you have problems and you drink or you take drugs or you do whatever it is you do. It makes you feel good for a while, but your problems are still there. So we have handled, our hands have handled the word of life. And in giving people the word of life, it doesn't matter whether or not we have an emotional reaction to that or not. The word is still there. It's alive and it's powerful and it does things that we cannot do. Amen. So, I can tell you guys are just loaded with excitement and amens today. See? So, I don't need that in order to give you what I'm going to give you. You don't need it in order to receive what you're going to receive. Somebody say amen to that. Okay, we're getting better. All right. Looks like Josiah, me and you, is going to have to carry the whole bunch. All right? All right. Um, let's take our Bibles, turn to Romans chapter one, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit from last Wednesday. We're talking about the gospel. Remember, we have four books in the Bible that God has delivered to us that fully tell what the gospel is all about. It is about the birth of Jesus Christ. And how many, just throwing this out here to you guys, you smart young people, okay, listen up now, see if you can answer this question. How many books of the Bible tell the birth of Jesus Christ? How many? Anybody know? Huh? Four? Four? Is she right or wrong, Callie? Huh? She's right? Matthew and Luke. Foretell the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, Mark and John... Don't begin at the beginning of Jesus' life. Where do they begin? As far as Jesus is concerned. At the beginning of his ministry, his baptism with John. That's where they begin. Okay? But, uh, now here's the next question. Do all four of the Gospels mention the crucifixion of Jesus? Is that a yes or no? Okay. The answer is yes. Do all four of the Gospels speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? 
JR? Callie? Is that a, is that a maybe yes? It's a yes. All four of them do. So you have two of them mentioning the birth, all four of them mentioning the crucifixion, all four of them detailing the resurrection. And then which, how many gospels mention uh, the story of Jesus rising up into heaven? Two? How about zero? Zero. It's in the book of Acts. It's not in the gospel. It's in the book of Acts where he ascended up into heaven. Okay? That was a trick question. Sounds like you guys got some... Have I not been your teacher all these years or what? Okay? Got some studying to do. So, we have four books in the Bible that give us the death or the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts then mentions Jesus ascending up into heaven. The two angels standing there saying, What ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up in the heavens for this same Jesus shall so come again in like manner as you saw him leave. And so then begins the 50 days after the Passover is the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost is poured out. And now they're out preaching the gospel as Jesus commanded them to do. So we start with Romans chapter 1, verse 16. The gospel, again, backing up just a little bit. And I want you to, uh, I asked you a while ago, uh, if you can think of places in the Old Testament that you think show the gospel or show what the gospel is. Maybe show the the birth of Christ, or they show the life of Christ somehow, or they show the ministry of Christ, they show the death of Christ, or his resurrection, any of those things like that, anything that you can think of in the Old Testament, and I'll ask that in a moment. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So we established uh, last Wednesday night, that the gospel is for everyone, but not everyone then is a recipient of the gospel. Everyone can receive the gospel, but they must believe in it. They must believe it. They must believe in what Christ did, what Christ said. They must accept that as their only means of salvation. And I'll, I'll ask you this, in your opinion, can you add something to salvation and still be saved? I would think not. Because Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel, let him be accursed. So when you add a work to salvation, you have altered the gospel and it's not the real gospel. So it must be to everyone that believeth. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. And obedience of the gospel is mentioned in this verse. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So there he's mentioning in Isaiah uh, 53 is where this comes from. Isaiah 53 details the things that happened to Christ while he was on the cross. The fact that he was bruised, that he was wounded. By his stripes we are healed. It pleased God to wound him, the Bible says. In other words, God wasn't going, ha, 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 oh, oh, they're beating Jesus. <laughs> that makes me so happy. It wasn't like that. It means that it satisfied the demands of a just and holy God that now someone is taking on themselves the punishment for sin. But can Christ have sinned and then take on the sins of the world. No. He must die solely for the sins of the world. And he cannot sin and he did not sin. Ephesians 1.13. In whom ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So here he mentions the word trust. In whom you also trusted. He mentions the fact that you heard the word of truth. Underline that, those three words in your Bible. Word of truth. 
Because that's it right there. If your gospel comes from a book that is not 100% true, it cannot be 100% the gospel. It has to be true. The word of truth is the source of the gospel. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We didn't pray, so let's do that now. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word today. We thank you, God, for gathering us together. Father, we look forward to the times coming when we are all gathered together back in our church uh, where we belong. Father, I pray, dear God, you would bless those, Lord, who have not come. Lord, that as you visit with them in their homes this evening, Father, you would stir it up in their hearts that when it is the right time, Father, you would bring them back into your house. And Father, we could get back to the business of preaching the gospel out of this place and admonishing one another and encouraging one another and comforting one another, praying for one another, knowing one another's needs. So, Father, help us to gain not just the people, Father, that we had when this thing started. Father, help us to gain some new people that want to come in and hear the truth of the gospel. So, Father, we just pray your blessings are added to your word uh, this evening. Open up our eyes. Give us understanding. Help us to preach the gospel everywhere we go. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, hey, man, way to go. I like that one. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Filipinos chapter 1. It's Galatians, Ephesians. Right after Ephesians, you find the book of Philippianos. Philippianos. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation. This is a covenant of belief. In other words, you must... In order to receive the benefits of God's free gift, you must believe. And fooey on everybody who would say that belief is a work. That's nonsense. I believe in my mind. I don't believe with my fingers. I don't believe with my legs. I don't believe with my back. I believe it with my heart. The gospel of my salvation. And some people do. They, they say faith is a work. And I preach a work salvation because I teach people that you must believe what God said. You must believe the account that he's given to us. You must believe the record that God has sent down to us. So he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent. We got a stranger coming in. Stranger danger. I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is this verse here, I think, applies to our situation now. I mean, Rose mentioned it the other day when she first came back to her first service back here after being quarantined. She said... Oh, it feels so good to be in church again. Amen. Amen. You know, to those that are saved, it's not a problem coming to church. It's not a problem. It doesn't bother us. It's not, oh, do we have to go to church again? We did that last year. Okay, it doesn't bother. It doesn't bother us. It bothers us when we can't come. So he says that we, with one mind... And even though we may not all agree on everything, touching everything, seeing everything the same way, but we do believe the same book. So we have one mind and we are striving together for the faith of the gospel. Where on any particular day when we've gathered together, you may come in that day and you may be weak in faith. While everybody sitting around you seems to be strong in faith. Or maybe that day I'm preaching a message about faith. Or God is speaking to you beyond my preaching about faith. But we're here together so that we can keep encouraging one another to keep believing. Don't let these things go. Don't fall away. Keep going on. Has anybody ever encouraged you 
when you felt like you wasn't doing so hot and somebody came along and you just knew they were praying for you or somebody put their arms around you, they forgot about social distancing, they said, I'm going to hug that person. And they gave you a big hug and they said, you know, I love you, I've been praying for you. Don't be offended at this. I'm just, I care about you and I, I want to see you live for God. Has anybody ever done that? Yes. And I'll tell you something, when, when, when you're really right with God, even though you may not feel like that, when somebody comes to you and does that, man, you think, wow, God, you sent them to me. I needed to hear that. So we're striving together for the faith of the gospel, belief in the gospel. Colossians chapter 1. Now get ready now because I'm going to ask you my question here in a little bit. Uh, verse 21, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you. By the way, what does the word reconciled mean? How do we use in everyday, in our everyday lives, the word reconcile? How do we use that term? Okay, that's one way. Huh? Okay. What about with your bank? What do you reconcile with the bank? Bank statement. Bank statement. Because you're supposed to keep a check ledger, which was always hard for me to do. I'd write the check and I'd say, oh, I'll remember it later. Next check, I wrote a bounced. That wasn't good. That was in Oklahoma. So... You keep your own register, but when the bank statement comes in, you sit down and you put a check mark as you go through the bank statement. The bank's records compared to your records, now you look and see that every check, every deposit, and every expenditure has been reconciled with the bank, and now there's no dispute. There's nothing that said, and I've seen poor Rose come in frustrated. Rose, what's the matter? I can't get this stupid checkbook figured out. I, something ain't right. The bank is saying this, I'm saying this, and uh, she'd get aggravated. And then she'd say, oh, I found it! And then the world is right again. Amen, Rose? Okay, so think of it in those terms. Reconciled means, between you and the bank, means that there's no dispute about what you owe. Because you don't owe anything. There's no dispute. Okay? And when you are reconciled with God, there's no dispute between you and God. You know that you don't owe anything to God. And everything that God has given to you, He doesn't owe you anything either. Amen! You don't owe each other anything. But you're glad to be reconciled. You're glad to serve one another. Now the world's right. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now it says that you continue in the faith grounded and settled. Josiah was asking me before the service what I thought about Stephen Anderson. And I don't mind bringing his name up. Because I will tell you straight out, that is somebody to avoid. Absolutely avoid that man. He will tell you the same thing about me. I don't care. But his idea of salvation... Get this now, because if this is true, this is what I would do. He'll go to somebody's house, knock on the door, get them to come to the door. I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. Talk to him about Jesus for a while, 15 minutes. And then he'll say, now, if you pray a prayer, you can be saved. And he'll get him to pray a prayer right there on the porch. Now you're saved. We invite you to church. So they go to his church one time hear what he says, and they're going, oh, I don't like this guy. And they leave. Then they go right back out into the sins that supposedly they were delivered from. Absolutely zero change in their life whatsoever. But according to Stephen Anderson, they're saved. 
and they're always going to be saved. And no matter how worse it gets in their life, no matter how bad they are, they're still going to heaven. And that's it. You can pray the prayer one time. You're eternally saved. And there's, there's no way you can out sin God. You can even forget to believe in God. You don't have to believe in God anymore because you believe that one time for about five minutes you believe and God says, that's good enough for me. And he saves you. But that's not what that says. That says that you be not, verse 23, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and that um, you continue in the faith grounded and settled meaning you're not going anywhere else and you're not going back to the old life you're not going back to the old gang the old people you're not doing that you are grounded you are rooted you have a firm foundation built an immovable rock that you're built on and you're not going anywhere. You're going to believe this Bible. I don't care what the news says. I don't care what science comes up with. And I certainly don't care what the aliens are going to come and say. You're going to believe this Bible exactly what it says. Amen? Amen. Now, Hebrews 4, turn there. Now, let's hear you. I gave you time to think about it. Show me, give me, tell me a story, something in the Old Testament that you believe shows the gospel, shows God saving his people or God saving somebody, God saving a woman, a man, a group of people, a family, God, whatever. Show me, give me something from the Old Testament that you believe shows the gospel all the way back before 2,000 years ago. Josiah. Abel. Okay, how so? Right. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. While Cain was offering what? He, yeah, he was offering the fruit of the ground. And if you, uh, t this is how it is with me as far as Cain is concerned. When you go back and look at what God cursed, God cursed the, the, the earth, the field. So here is Cain offering a cursed sacrifice. And so you're saying that because Abel offered a blood sacrifice, that his was accepted. I like that. That's good. I not really thought about that, but yeah, that's true. Okay? So it shows forth, and it's in Genesis 4. Yeah. And he was slain for that. His sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was rejected. Yes, Rose. Daniel, in what way? Right. He, he trusted God, thrown into the lion's den. God saved him, but he trusted God through that. Give me another one from the book of Daniel. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. In four chapters... One, two, three, and four. You studied the first four chapters of the book of Daniel. You'll see the process that God leads Nebuchadnezzar to understanding there's only one true God. And he believes it at the end of his life. I will see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven, I believe. I believe that. Okay? Because he turned. He changed his heart. God raked him over the coals over it. But he changed his belief. He changed his heart. And he said, there's only one God, and that's the one I'm going to worship. Okay? Give me another one from the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They trusted God. They said, I'm not bowing down to that idle shepherd. And they said, we're going to believe that God will save us. And who shows up? Jesus Christ shows up and saves them. Okay? Somebody else. Yes, Callie. I thought you had your hand raised. Okay. Because Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
Okay, so that's, that's another one. They believed, which caused them to look. Oh, look, they looked, that's work salvation. Now they had to believe first. Had to believe it. Yes, Rose. Okay, so how does that show the gospel? Okay. One way of looking at it is Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And that was after his crucifixion. So, okay, very good. Anybody else? Yes, JR. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac. Father, we have the wood. Here's the mountain. Where's the lamb? God will provide himself a lamb and he did he made himself the lamb that took away the sins of the world and abraham believed exactly what god said offer him up and that's what he did he didn't sacrifice me to offer him anybody else joshua and caleb because that's what hebrews 4 is about it's, the, it's about the day of, turn to Hebrews 4. It's about the day of provocation. When the fathers tempted me in the wilderness, they sent the spies in. You even have the number there, four. The number four, as far as the days they were in there, 40 days. Sent those 12 men in there, 40 days. In those 40 days, they saw the land. They saw how good it was. They come back and said, 10 of them said, we can't go in. He brought up an evil report. Remember the wording of Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? The report was the gospel. So they brought up a false gospel. Because they said... Gospel is about giving us life, letting us live. So they said, if we go back to Egypt, we'll live. That's what they were saying. And Joshua and Caleb's rip, ripping their clothes and they're going, what are you guys doing? Our father, God, told us that we could have that land. God is going to make those meat, those giants meat for us. We're going to eat them. I don't know what giant tastes like, but God said they're going to be meat for us. They're going to fall before us. We're going to walk in there and they're just going to take one look at us and die. And I believe that could have very well what would have happened had they gone in. The giants would have seen them freaked out and just collapsed and died. Knowing that the power of God was on them. But those two, the Bible says, had a different spirit in them. A spirit of belief. And so the gospel was right there. So Hebrews 4. Let's look at this. Let's spend a little time in this. Let us therefore fear. Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. What good would it do for you to live a good life all your life. And reject the gospel. Die the next day. What a shame that would be. Because they were right. They were within. A, just a walking distance. To the promised land. Because they sent the spies in. From where they were camped. The spies walked right into Canaan. Spied out the land and came back. They did that in 40 days. So surely. They were within 20 days of being to the promised land. They were right there. And they decided, you know what a point of no return is? What is that? You're flying from Detroit to London. And when you get halfway, a mile past halfway... You're at the point of no return. 
Now, it's actually going to be quicker if you just keep on going to London than it is for you to be turning around to go back. It's a point of no return. Okay? And they got to a point where they were within an easy distance to the promised land. And they said, let's go back to Egypt. God would let them, of course. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They had the promise of the promised land. They had God's promise of blessing that if they went in there, God would have their, uh, their enemies fall before them. But they didn't believe it. So without faith, it profits you nothing, these stories that we have in the Bible. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn to in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they that to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They believed for a while. I've seen people in my life believe for a while. I've baptized people who believed for just a little while and then after that they just didn't believe anymore they didn't care anymore and you could tell and to this day they live a reprobate life you mean to tell me that God's going to let them go into heaven absolutely not and that's not a work that's a lack of faith. They don't trust God. You can be baptized all the many times as you want. And that still will not cause you to believe what God said. So verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth, he limiteth a certain day saying in David. Today after so long a time as it is said. Today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, meaning Joshua, you can underline that in your Bible in Hebrews 4, 8. The word Jesus here is actually Joshua. Because it says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? And it's clearly that he's, it's very clear that he's speaking of Joshua. And in Hebrew, there is no difference between Joshua and Jesus. They're the same name. Okay? So, this is when I say the name Jesus is 980 times in the King James. If you type it in, look it up, you'll find 983. But there's three occurrences where it's speaking. You can tell it's speak, not speaking about the one Jesus. You have one here. You have the uh, another Jesus mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11. I can't remember where the third one was, but you can tell obviously it's not speaking of our Jesus. So 980 times is what that leaves, which is 70 times 7 times 2, 490 times 2, however you look at it. But that's what it's based on. So Joshua or Jesus could not give them the rest. So verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So right now, it's not the time to rest. Right now, it's the time to work. There remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Unbelief will cause you to fall. For the word of God, 
This is the context that phrase is in. The word of God is quick, means it's alive and it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. While somebody else may not be able to read your mind, God can. Your Bible can. You ever read something and you just knew that God wrote that specifically for you? Amen. Yes, sir. I've had it happen many times. Um, verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So what this means, all you young people, God sees everything, doesn't he? Right, Josiah. Right? Just nod your head, yes. Does God see everything? Yes. Journey, does God see everything? Hope, does God see everything? Even when you pick your nose and nobody's looking? Does God see that? Uh-huh. He sees everything. Um, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Don't stop believing. Don't stop turning your, keeping your life right with God. Don't, don't profess something different with either your words or your actions. Amen. Amen. Verse 15, For ye have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the verse that young Bradley, when he first started coming here, he was still sort of on the fence about what to believe. He was part of the Mormon church. And he came here on a Sunday morning early and was talking to me. And he, I could tell he was really troubled. I said, Bradley, what's going on? He said, well, I have this girlfriend. And the Mormon church has told me that I can't have any more to do with her because she's not a Mormon. They were basically ruling his life, telling him, you need to get rid of this girl and get you a good Mormon girl. And so, and I said, well, I said, I don't know what kind of person she is. I said, but I don't think they have a right to tell you. He said, they think they have a right to tell me. I went, oh, okay. And then he said something about going and confessing to the bishop. And I went, what? He said, oh yeah. He said, we have to confess our sins to the overseer there at that Mormon temple there. In, I think it was at Hillsboro. And I looked at him and the Holy Ghost said, Mike, say this. I looked him right in the eye and I said, Bradley, I guarantee you, you didn't tell him everything. And he looked down and he said, no, I didn't. And I said, why didn't you tell him everything? I said, he said, because I was afraid. I said, that's exactly right. And I started quoting, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. And he finished it, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. I said, is there anything that you can't tell God? He said, no, I can tell God everything. That's right, because he already knows it, right. And I said, you need to get out of that place. And it wasn't too long after that, that God really struck him and dealt with him. And he didn't go back to the Mormon church ever again after that. He cut him off. 
Okay, yeah, and it, same thing. And it was funny because those two boys, identical twins, and it was an identical situation that brought Brady out of the Jehovah's Witness. It was over a girl. The girl wasn't Jehovah's Witness. The Jehovah's Witness told Brady, you can't have her, you can't date her, you can't marry her, you can't have anything to do with her because she's not Jehovah's Witness. So it made him mad. And he left over that. Same thing with Bradley. Made him mad and he left over that. Neither one of those girls are their wives now. Okay? Amen. So that's God using one thing to get you out of Egypt, another thing to get you into Canaan. Amen. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That right there is the heart of the gospel. Because before Christ, nobody, nobody can go into the most holy place in the presence of God. Not even Aaron, except one day a year under special circumstances, under certain conditions. And even at that, he was to wear bells on the fringes of his garment so that if he died while he was in the most holy place, they had a rope tied to him and they would pull him out. They knew they couldn't go even go in there and save him out of there. They just simply pulled the rope and pulled his dead carcass out of there. That was because God is holy and you cannot get in the presence of God by yourself. But now we have a new and a living way. Now we have a way to have access to the very throne of God. And it's by way of Jesus Christ, the righteous. So not, it's not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's him being the mediator between us and God. Um, I mentioned that I, that I was watching Frozen 2, and I'm going to present this before too long. It's pure, pure witchcraft. The whole movie is, start to finish. Because there is the human world that all the frozen people live in. And then there is the spirit world where the elements of earth, air, fire, and water all dwell in. It's the world of magic. The magic kingdom. That's Disney's kingdom. Magic kingdom. What does that tell you? Disney's not for Jesus. Okay? Never has been. So, Elsa finds out that there is a fifth spirit, a fifth element called spirit or ether. And that that fifth element is what bridges the gap between our world and the world of magic. So Elsa finds out that she is the bridge. She's the one who mediates between man and the spirits. That's witchcraft. So think of what's opposite of that. Here we are as earth people. There is God in heaven, the father of spirits, the one who created those spirits, the father and Jesus is not a bridge, he's a mediator. The one who stands between us and the kingdom of his father so that we can be joined with him. It is by Christ alone that we can have access to the throne of mercy and have all of your sins forgiven. Amen. That's the covenant of belief that he was talking about. All right? So, awesome. Amen. When you, I showed John a little bit of it this morning. And I'm just, I'm doing screen captures and making notes. And wait till you see what I see. It is pure New Age occult witchcraft indoctrination it's, it's wicca 101 okay amen